Good evening. Here's what's happening. We're interrupting our special broadcasting to bring you this special report. Yesterday afternoon, five Americans were shot down by other Americans on the airstrip at Port Kaituma, Guyana. One of the dead, Representative Leo Ryan of California. They'd gone to investigate a cult called the People's Temple, headed by a man known as the Reverend Jim Jones, and they were killed by members of that cult. Appalling as that was, it did not prepare us for what was to follow. What you're about to see almost defies description, and some of you may not want to watch it. Nine hundred ten died in the poison ritual of the People's Temple. The word on everybody's lips was shades of Auschwitz. They found tremendous quantities of potassium cyanide poison mixed with Kool-Aid. The bodies seemed awful and orderly, not flung about like corpses after a battle, but neat, hand in hand sometimes, arms about each other's shoulders. Jones' victims were our brothers and sisters. What was it that caused them to leave their Christian churches and join Jones? Why in the world did so many people agree to kill themselves? You have never met a man like Jim Jones before. I am here, the spirit of Christ, to set you free, to deliver you from your captivity. Jim was really captivating. He had this way of really reaching into your emotions. The community that he had developed in People's Temple was what I had been looking for all along. It was full of life. There was a message of equality for all people. You're going all over the country, taking the message of God, and carrying it out to the masses. I am creator of the People's Temple Mission, and I will have my way, or I will tear hell out of everything you've built. The more power he got, the darker the story got. What my father was doing was building a little kingdom for himself. Your whole life, it was all based around the church. There was a consequence to any infraction. You punk, you damn gangland punk! We were going to be hunted down and killed if we ever left. There is something seriously wrong here. You cannot stamp me out! I'm here to save! The leader has lost his mind. People are being held here against their will. You bring those kids back here! This dark side. Let's just be done with it. Let's be done with the agony of it. We'll expand and expand. Hurry, my children, hurry until finally it explodes in the Guyanese jungle. If we can't live in peace, then let's die in peace. survivors of the Jonestown suicide murders were met by friends, relatives, and a handful of People's Temple members from San Francisco. One of the biggest mysteries in the Jonestown story is what kind of a leader could order mass suicide and be obeyed? Who was Jim Jones that grown-ups would kill themselves and their children for him? I think there's an opinion that these people that went down there were off they were a little crazy. They, uh, they weren't like us. When all they were were people who wanted a better life and thought that they were going to get it and worked damn hard to get it. Before joining the People's Temple, I was a teenager. Just kind of a little lost soul floating around. I was in an interracial relationship. My first wife was African American. Our relationship was not embraced by family, either hers or mine. Cheryl and I were kind of in the world by ourselves. We had no support system whatsoever and felt very isolated in the world. And we walked into that temple. It was full of life.
everyone was uh, was singing. It was very alive. It was very up, and you know, people dancing in the spirit. We were embraced as an interracial couple, and there was a message of inclusivity. There was a message of equality for all people. People were passionate. People were engaged. They were talking about that there was this injustice in the world and, you know, discrimination. And so that moved me. I ended up in People's Temple because my sister got involved in heavy drugs. And my mother just not knowing where to turn. So a friend of hers told her there's this church that has a drug rehab program for youth. I felt like I was a part of this incredible community that put self aside because there was a greater good. And the greater good was to ensure that babies didn't go to bed hungry, that there was equality for everyone. I liked that. I liked the thought that I could actually make a difference. The first time I went to a People's Temple meeting, as soon as I walked in the door, I felt like I was home. In the summer of 66, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. I was 19 years old and it really messed with my head. When I was discharged from the Marine Corps, I didn't really know what to do with myself. I was searching spiritually. The People's Temple was a perfect kind of synthesis of what I was feeling at the time, spiritually and politically. And I still hadn't even met Jim Jones yet. There is, in fact, somebody to respond anytime there is a need. The man who is, in fact, People's Temple. Let me present to you Reverend Jim Jones. This administration is for no other purpose That's right. than to show mankind right. the road to freedom. Amen. But I'm here as a sample and example to show you that you can bring yourself up with your own bootstraps yeah. and you can become your God. Amen. We shall have our freedom here and now. Jim was really captivating. As a child, I just thought, wow, here's a man who has this speaking ability that is dynamic. Think of Martin Luther King at his best in terms of oratory now, and that's who Jones was. From the lowest of economic positions, from the misery of poverty near the railroad tracks, I came to show you that the only God you need is within you. He had this way of really reaching your emotions. He would address each kind of grouping within People's Temple to get us engaged. If you wanted him to be a minister, he would talk about the Bible. If you wanted him to be political, he was absolutely going to include that. Edie? My fingers, are your fingers numb? your hand out to me and then there was this other aspect that we had never seen and that was the healings reach the fingers out that are bothering you <laughs> now is the pain gone The idea that someone could call someone out of the audience, know about them, and then heal them of some ailment, that was amazing. I've never seen anything like that. During the course of my time at the People's Temple, I witnessed many, many, many healings. Come forth, my dear. Stand up. 
Take that step. Take that step. Move forward. Move forward. Go, Kristen. Go. Go. Even though I'm a skeptic, I had to be convinced because what's real is real that I could see, I could see. He said, in the name of Christ, you're healed, and my pain was gone. And now, a year and a half later, it's still gone, and I praise God for that. I've been waiting all this time since Vietnam to contribute my energies to something that I felt was actually doing good. I jumped in with both feet. The one thing that I never thought, never even dreamed of, is that our biggest enemy was the leader. Now will each of you give a very fond embrace, a salutary kiss of greeting to your neighbor. Let's fill this atmosphere with warmth. It wasn't just Jim Jones standing there. It was really the ambiance that he created around him. His wife, Marceline, sitting on stage, seemingly, you know, mesmerized by what he was saying. And he'd always talked about himself as a family man. Jim had adopted kids of all different races. So, you know, I was pretty sold that he was a good dad and a good leader. When the Joneses decided to adopt, they came up with the concept of the rainbow family. Let's try to vary our family so we will be the living embodiment of how people of all races come together and belong together. As the story goes, my family went in to adopt a baby girl. And I guess from, from what my mother used to tell me, I started crying. My mother went over to pick me up. My father came over and saw this black baby in his wife's arms. They looked at the social worker at the orphanage and said, why can't we adopt this child instead? And they kind of went, no, 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 no. That's, a, that's an African-American child. And my father took this political stance. No, I will adopt any child that, that, that we want. So I probably should say I never liked the title, The Rainbow Family. We were a mixed bag for sure, especially for that time. Now, in many respects, that's lovely, regardless of the motivation. But what I felt was that much of what was created as a family was done for show. It's hard to know if dad really believed anything or what he believed if he did. My father was starved for attention from a very early age and that never let up. If anything, it intensified. Jim Jones is born and he's raised in rural Indiana where, back then, one of the main purposes in life is to fit in, to be like everybody else. And from the time Jim Jones is born, that doesn't happen. Part of the problem are his parents. His father was destroyed by World War I. My grandma Jones, she wasn't around a lot. So my father wasn't being nurtured in a way that I feel a child is best nurtured. And I think he compensated for that. And so he sought the approval of others in a variety of ways. In a small town like Lynn, Jim was a little on the weird side. Jim had this flair for the dramatic, and I, th I think he enjoyed being dramatic. 
He would recruit the other kids to come to elaborate funerals he's holding for roadkill. I don't know whether it was just for its own sake or whether it was to freak people out. All the boys in Lynn during World War II started playing war games. And they all wanted to be allied soldiers, except one. Jim Jones was mesmerized by the way Hitler could have a whole audience enraptured, stand up and perform, and order people to do things, and they would do it. He was eccentric, and that could be off-putting to some children. He was very controlling in his nature. He did spend a, a fair amount of time on his own. He was left to his own devices. So where could he find this community? I think with my father, church was where he could find solace, find peace. The other boys want to play baseball, ride their bikes. Jim joins five different churches. And as a child, he saw that in those church services, there was one guy, the guy that was talking, that got all the attention. My father's picking up different components of each religion. But I do think you ought to stand for the glory of God if you're that kind of smart. Baptist preacher who would you know, slam the Bible down. The Pentecostal person talking in tongues, you know, skipping up and down the aisle. Jimmy's not just watching the people rolling on the floor. He's paying attention to these preachers. What do they say? How do they get people built up to this point? How does this minister keep an audience enthralled? It was a given. Of course he's going to be a minister. What else is this weird boy going to be? His mother instilled in him this concern for uh, the, the downtrodden, the, the have-nots. And I think that he genuinely felt it was wrong that people be judged by the color of their skin or their background or what they come from. His message resonated more with African Americans. They were so tired of the Jim Crow laws. I'm going to tell you one thing, darling. You and me are the same. To the white man, we're the same. They don't think any more of us. They don't want any more to do with us. Jones in the black community in Indianapolis becomes a hero. But you can only go so far in Indianapolis. He was not going to be just a small town guy. He wanted to be more universally known. He was not somebody committed to the word of God or the Bible. He wanted notoriety. He wanted power. Where is the power? That's where I want to go. California, that's the place. That's where you can make things happen. But he had to bring as many of his followers as he could. What's he going to tell them the reason they have to go? We have to be prepared to take our flight in the case of Armageddon that would spring forth in a nuclear hell. Jones he starts prophesizing. There's going to be nuclear war. Everyone living here is going to die. It's his excuse to get the hell out of Indiana. And it works. In terms of a darker side that would ultimately end up being the tragedy at Jonestown, I think that that started actually in California. Regardless of what good works the temple was involved in, what my father was doing was building 
a little kingdom for himself. I am creator of the People's Temple Mission, and I will have my way, or I will tear hell out of everything you do. the river valley we had some resources and people moved into the different homes and jim had bought this home with this big grape field in front of it and shortly after jim had the resources to build a church when they relocated to redwood valley a new group of people were attracted to the preaching of jim jones and this was this white educated elite the membership of people's temple at that point tripled my life changed when i moved up to redwood valley it was really kind of nice having been raised in the city we were very busy with church activities and duties and when you went to sleep you kind of felt like you helped people and accomplished something there was something that wasn't right. I shall do all the miracles that you said your God would do and never did. Yeah. I shall come and heal you all the diseases that you prayed for that never happened. I think Jim was a power addict early on. He was always watchful, trying to think how he could control People's Temple members. When People's Temple has grown big enough, Jones can start teaching the real purpose of People's Temple. The only thing that brings perfect justice, freedom and equality, perfect love and all of its beauty and holiness is socialism. So and socialism is wrong. We were being introduced to socialism. Socialism meant that everybody would have the same. There would be no starvation, there would be no one going without any clothes. All the basic needs that a human being is supposed to have, they would have under socialism. He starts encouraging communal living. And let's say in a house that might have been designed for six people to live, he'll put 12, 15, or even 20. And they'll sleep on mattresses on the floor. That was so strange to me. But it felt good to sacrifice because the sacrifice was for the greater good. No one realized that Jim was using socialism to bring people in and control people. This is a church that you're either all the way in or all the way out. There's no in between. And this church expected you to give up everything. He didn't want people having sex, you know, because you were supposed to use your sexual energy for the cause. We were always asked to further our commitment. Are you willing to get up your little petty desires and reach your comforts, or are you just full of hot air? I don't own a car, I don't own any new furniture, I never buy any new clothes, I have never bought a new pair of shoes in my life, and that's why I am free. You're not free, you're a slave! You're doing just exactly what the man wants you to do. Everything went to people simple. All the things that my mother had, antiques, china, and his beautiful home in Ukiah. My mother gave her house up for Jim Jones. The whole idea of going communal is that you start to cut down on the outside influence. Everybody is working as much as possible. Jones said to one of his followers, the key is keep them poor, keep them tired, and they'll never leave. Jones' spiel was that family relationships are the sickest relationships of all. So the families were separated. I cared for four children myself that were not mine. They were someone else's children. Now Jones wants his followers to refer to him and Marceline as father and mother. Marceline loved the idea they were a team. They were working together. He pretended he was a family man, but you know, really that was all a facade. That was all the public persona. Nothing is as it appears. Most people had no idea if Jim was not being faithful. He found another long-term companion. 
Her name was Carolyn Layton. And Carolyn was absolutely enraptured of Jim Jones. The things he was saying and doing mirrored her beliefs. As a young child, I think I first started noticing that when Jim would leave at night and come home in the morning, his not being faithful, it was just wrong. I was mortified, horrified by it. That's where my esteem for him gradually uh, fell apart. Eventually, I remember my mother wanting a divorce. She wanted the kids. And Jim said, you will die before you take my kids away from me. This dark side that appears really for the first time in Ukiah will expand and expand until finally it explodes in the Guyanese jungle. People's Temple population starts to grow. And as it grows, so does Jones's need for money. Jim was looking for more membership, so in about 1972, we started bus trips around the country. People's Temple buys a fleet of Greyhound buses. Jim Jones is going to go to the big cities, and he is going to attract huge crowds, get a lot of money, and then he'll come back, he can use that in Ukiah. We would pass out leaflets, speak to people, try to get them to the service, and tout the wonders of Jim Jones and People's Temple. As a teenager, what, what better life could you have? You're hanging out with all your friends, you're going all over the country, and taking the message of God and carrying it out to the masses. Along the way, people always joined. A couple buses aren't filled. That's so as people want to join, they can just get on the bus and go with him. And as his following grows, they find peripheral ways to make money. He starts selling pictures that Jones has blessed. This picture here would sell for five dollars. This is another picture that he had uh, for protection. No. And if you don't have money for the pictures, give us your name and address and Reverend Jones will bless a penny and you'll be in his prayers. They market all kinds of things. Money comes pouring in. No need to worry, I told you out of church. I'll get you on that Greyhound bus if you don't have a penny. And I'll give you the finest room you ever saw. Just get on my bus and I'll take you on to the promised land. Hey, Spirit. The man is a master entertainer. Everything is planned to the minute. And then come the healings. Sister Ingram, you're concerned about the losing, losing of your sight. Take your glasses off. You concentrate hard. How many fingers? Three. You've been feeling pain here in the chest? Yeah. Look at my face. Where's your pain? Don't be it, Everybody is out of their minds with excitement. And Jones has never been more dramatic. One time, a person broke their leg. So they were taken to the hospital and put a cast on it. The next service, the name was called and asked if they wanted to walk again. You see, walk on this leg like the kids ever The cast was cut off right in front of everybody. The leg was broken yesterday.
you're seeing this woman who's all of a sudden running through the church and everyone's just excited and Father's healed her. And then a big thing at the time was removal of cancers. You have a cancer. I can tell. Come forward. I'm going to heal you. This sister, when she was in the church of God and Christ, no one could heal her. Five times operated for cancer. The doctor sold her up to die. But I, I said one day, a year ago, your time has come and she spit up the cancer. You're healed. People were jumping and happy and I thought, oh my gosh, she's healed of cancer. I'm excited. The whole church is just in a frenzy. As time wore on, I started questioning the healings. I should have known that it was a lie. And people died because of that. As time wore on, I started questioning the healings. There was a rumor that there was something nefarious going on. The healing with the woman that they cut the cast off and she's running around. They drugged her and they put the cast on her while she was asleep. So when she woke up, they told her that she had fallen. They said, oh, you broke your leg. And she had no recollection of it at all. Her leg was never broken. The fake healings were a way to attract people falsely. Even though they were great tools to get people to believe, they were nefarious. I personally know someone's grandmother who Jim apparently healed of cancer. And then when cancer came back, guess what she said? It must be because I don't believe in it. She wasn't going to get treatment. She was just going to pray harder and have more faith in Jim. Well, she died of cancer. And that's just one of, I'm sure, hundreds of stories. This is one of those areas where that should have been a red flag that I just ignored. I'm not saying it's right, but I believe the temple was an opportunity to create something that was truly great. And that's why I stayed as long as I did. The temple was set up so no one could join the church without first being checked out thoroughly by Jones. Everything required him to be involved. And the pressure got to him. And Jones became an abuser of drugs. Jim Jones shared with the congregation that he had to take something to keep him up because he worked 24-7, 24 hours a day for the cause of socialism. He needed amphetamines to get up and keep going. His schedule would last from early in the morning until 2 or 3 a.m. So he was sleeping maybe three or four hours a night. And then when he could rest, he, he had to take tranquilizers to come down. And I must say it is a great effort to be gone. I wish it upon another, but no one else has the faculty that I do. In the meantime, I shall be God, and beside yeah. me there shall be no other. Yeah. Yeah. I had no idea that Jim was on drugs. No idea at all. Later, I would discover the sunglasses was because he was hiding the way his eyes looked. Everybody remembers that Jim Jones always wore dark glasses. It was one of his signature appearance things. And he told everyone it was because the Spirit of the Lord was so powerful in him. If you look directly in his eyes, you might be burned on the spot. But the real reason he did was his eyes were so red and watery and swollen from the drug use. As he was taking more and more drugs, you know, his personality changed. Behind the scenes, Jim's narcissism was just uncontained. And he was surrounded by mistresses. The women that Jones was having sex with almost all considered an honor to do this for father. He portrayed himself as a martyr, that he would have to have sex 
with these different members to solidify their alliance, to solidify their loyalty. He made a lot of really crude remarks. If I need to get you to socialism on the tip of my dick, I'll do it. Each time he had sex with somebody, he did it as one more notch in his belt of how to become yet more powerful. Jones always said, the ends justifies the means, which means you can do anything you need to do to get to where you want to go, because the goal is for the greater good. So no matter how you get there, you get there, which excuses anything, any behaviors at all. To all outward appearances, Jones and People's Temple had accomplished great things and there was unlimited future. But the lust for power continues to grow. He would create enemies to bind his followers closer. The government was out to get us and it was a conspiracy. Look at all the people that have been killed. Look at all of our young people who are in prison. Actual events were used to uh, solidify his position. And it was extremely effective because there was truth to it. I just come in from Washington, just flew in on the plane from the conference with the top-notch leaders. I listened to them talk about plan takeovers. I listened to them to talk about it like it was just an ordinary Sunday school picnic. Task force warns nation to get ready for riots and to get ready for martial law. They're going to put all the poor people away and they're going to come for you. They're going to come for your children. There was so much paranoia about the ways that law enforcement was going to break up the community of People's Temple. They looked at themselves as people who were being persecuted from the outside. We ended up going to church more and more. Before you knew it, your whole life, it was all based around the church. Now we're in an isolationist mode, where Jim would tell us that we were, you know, that black people were going to be put in concentration camps dictatorships that can come in like they did with the Japanese. So oh, this country won't ever do that. It did it already. He's tapping into people's fears. He's tapping into people's insecurities. The paranoia was real in people's temple. Get ready for identification marks to be put on your body and an identification number even necessary tattooed on you. You say, oh, America wouldn't do that. Don't talk to me about what America would not do. We lived through Martin being assassinated. We lived through Malcolm being assassinated. We lived through Robert Kennedy being assassinated. Assassination for leaders was something you thought about. Jim was saying that he was getting death threats because he was making such a difference and stirring up so much controversy in the community of bringing black people and white people together that he was a threat to the status quo. One Sunday service, I was out in the parking lot talking to someone. We're all out after church and we're having festivities. The kids are playing the basketball court. We got tables out for the meal in between church. Bright, sunny, beautiful day. We were enjoying ourselves. And then all hell broke loose.
people were screaming, father shot. There's blood flowing from his chest. Father's been shot and screams and a lot of anguish, people crying out. There's someone trying to assassinate Jim Jones. Then they rushed everybody into the temple. We're scared because we don't know if someone else is out there shooting. Was it one shooter? Was it more than one shooter? And so we're in the temple and people are just in a panic that we might lose father. A mourn quiet comes over the whole community. I was really afraid. The idea of outside threat, the idea of them and us, if you weren't with us, you were against us. That was the message we heard constantly. The doors opened, and one of Jim's security was carrying the shirt with blood. There's red stains on it. And there's two holes that you can put a finger through. And Jim's behind him, but there's not a mark on him. He's healed himself. You can put me into the noose. You can hang my body, but I'll spring up again. You cannot stamp me out. I'm here to stay. People are in a frenzy. I mean, crying, joyful, ecstatic. It was, the energy was just, it was just electric. And we're thinking, oh my God, Father healed himself. Yeah. Have you never seen anyone shot down as I was before your eyes with the blood spurting from the body and healed themselves? Yet I, the socialist lawyer, did that. How many believe that I am the Savior? The only Savior. They were convinced that this man is God. It brought people together. He was going to be the force, the person who was going to lead us to the promised land. It wasn't until later that I knew that that was fake. Later on, I learned from my mother how that had gone down and that blanks were fired uh, to fake this, this attack. I don't know how it was faked, but my father was always looking for ways to create drama so that he could be the savior and the champion within all that drama. Everything he did was a test to see how many people were going to stay and how many people were going to leave. So every moment he's pushing the envelope a little bit, you know, a little bit further, right? People were true believers. And you wanted to be because you were going to change the world. I believed in him 100%, and I believed in who he said he was. I would follow Jim Jones anywhere, and I did. When we moved to San Francisco, things went to the next level. People's Temple is getting more people, they're getting more money, the fame is spreading. But you can only go so far in Redwood Valley. In San Francisco, we have more political strength, and that's important. You got the backing of some people. We build outside of the city, we don't have that backing. In San Francisco, he is going to gradually insinuate himself until he becomes a power broker. I first heard of People's Temple when I was a part-time writer for the Chronicle back in the uh, early 70s. They would turn out big crowds at rallies. The city was full of groups that had shown they weren't happy with conventional life. Jones very much played into that. He was a new guy with a new message, with a new act. This country will not be safe until we do something to share the wealth and share it completely and fairly and democratically and peacefully. 
He donated money. He participated in causes. He cultivated friends in a very clever way. He rose fast as a political power. Jim Jones was known as a person. If you had a political activism going on, call Jim Jones, get him involved. And Jim Jones had to see how he could manipulate it for himself. Herman Jones, how do you account for such an avid following as you seem to have? I'm principled and dedicated to my people. He loved the attention. You know, he loved to be mingling with the creme de la creme, the politicians in San Francisco. He was thriving in that. Let me thank first of all, and I'm very grateful for this tremendous crowd. Rosalind Carter was in the city to campaign for her husband. And where she was at, there weren't that many people that showed up. And so somebody called up Jones and said, can you get some people here? And so we filled up three buses and drove everybody down there. And all of a sudden there was a big crowd. And on the news, it was look at the warm reception that Rosalind Carter is receiving here in San Francisco. And Rosalind Carter met with him privately to talk about his political involvement in Jimmy Carter's election. So much to where he got invited to the inauguration. The legend of Jim Jones and People's Temple is out there. And money comes pouring in. Very much interested in this. He's becoming more and more popular. The newspapers cover him like a celebrity. In San Francisco, you got Willie Mays, you got the jazz scene, and now all of a sudden you've got Jim Jones. My father was always grandiose, as far back as I can remember, and that grandiosity only grew as the temple grew. He was always managing his image of himself, because he was always at war with that voice inside of him, I believe, that was telling him he wasn't enough, he was a fraud. And I think that's where drugs really came in much more heavily. Jim Jones had always been mistrustful of most people, but the rampant drug use increased his paranoia. As the temple grew, Jones felt like he's losing touch with rank and file members. He feels as though some of his people may betray him. So he creates the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission was made up of the leadership of People's Temple. And they were the ones who were closest to Jim Jones personally. They were the ones that were making decisions about the day-to-day -day operations of People's Temple. At their meetings, it gives Jones a chance to sit there and listen to what people are talking about and get some sense of the way his people are feeling. I was on the planning commission for five years. During a planning commission meeting, I'd pass around a paper and people who had information about how somebody was doing would write down notes. I'd type it up and then give it to Jim and the secretaries. It became more of a spying on you thing. The planning commission at the People's Temple, as far as I was concerned, was an enforcement agency. If you got called to the Planning Commission, you were in some serious, serious trouble. There was a consequence to any infraction, whether it be you fell asleep during a meeting, someone reported that you were having an affair with someone else. I was called to the Planning Commission. I had just gotten my ears pierced. Jim Jones said, well, what did you do that for? Well, bourgeois is that. And I, I made some remark, and they all just jumped me. All these people had started pounding me and stuff. And I think they ripped the earrings out. I was not considered by Jim Jones as one of the faithful. I got in trouble a lot. Why is it this whether you do this? I save you from worse than death. That, that I was just um, pissed at the time. I don't think you will change where you're going. 
I mean, I know you're gonna kick my ass, but really, John, uh, get out of the way. Let's see you head. <laughs> you talk, you goddamn gangland punk. You cause us trouble week after week, month after month. Got my blood pressure rolling, punk, motherfucker. It's so sickening. I can't really talk about it. And then it gets to the boxing matches. You're going to have an opponent that would beat on someone that was not even a physical match to them. It would get bloody. They're not supposed to even fight back. You're just supposed to get beat. And Jim, he would laugh over this type of thing, this, that sinister laugh he had. <laughs> you fucking bitch, you don't mess with me, I'll kill you. <laughs> Jim Jones had a sadistic quality. He absolutely did. He enjoyed that type of thing. It was like a gladiator sport to him, I think. They set up the counseling department, and eventually I got made head counselor. And I'll never forget one night in a meeting, I saw somebody very severely beaten, and I saw them the next day professing their love for Jim Jones as they were walking in the church. And I looked at them, and I said to myself, I don't ever want to be broken, and in this situation, as a broken person. I'd rather be dead than to live the rest of my life in this situation. I knew I had to leave. From the time he organized his first storefront church in Indianapolis, Jones took it personally any time anybody left. He couldn't stand it. Because loyalty was the greatest value within people's temple, defection was the greatest sin. There was always the fear that anybody that left would be utilized by the enemies to help tear down people's temple. Some people wanted to desert our ship. They thought we were going to sink. You that stayed with us, you were repaid. You were repaid for your loyalty. You that stood with your father, you have been the good children. He preaches that once you're in with us, you're part of us forever. He has members sign statements claiming that they have done all sorts of terrible things from committing cold-blooded murder to planning the assassination of the President of the United States. I signed blank pieces of paper. I signed pieces of paper that I wanted to kill the President. I signed pieces of paper that I molested my child. Try being in a room with 50 people and you're asked to sign a blank piece of paper and say, no, I'm not going to sign it. If you didn't sign it, they're like, oh, are you thinking about leaving? Should we be concerned about you? He's got something on everyone, all of it manufactured, but making it clear if you leave this church, we'll make it hard on you. I was done, spent. Grace Stone was people's temple royalty. She had a child while in the church. Jones claimed the child as his. She knew a lot about church activities. She was very informed on how the church operated. But then the personal stuff, the beatings, were just too heavy a memory and experience for her to ignore. I'll never forget we were on a cross-country trip and one of the members came to me and he said, Grace, please stop acting out, stop acting up. He said, they're talking about you, they're gonna get you when we get back, and they're gonna beat you up. And I said to myself, I'll never allow myself to get beaten. I knew I had to leave. And um, I just gathered some stuff. I didn't tell anyone I was leaving. I snuck out. and I ended up escaping with one of the bus drivers. We were told to leave the state because we were gonna be hunted down and killed if we ever left. She left the temple, but leaving her son behind. She knew that she couldn't probably pry him loose and get away like that. It was hard. But it was, it was very hard, very devastating for me. 
and we left on July 3rd. And I'll never forget, we woke up to what we thought were gunshots. We sat up and we went, oh my God, they've already found us. Only to realize it was firecrackers. It was 4th of July. Life has no meaning other than principle. And I could not let this child go with that criminal, Mrs. Gray Stone. It seems that some people have lost their way. Tragically lost their way. What kind of morality would cause her to do this to father? Every time someone would leave, Jones would absolutely lose it. Jones was so paranoid about the loyalty of his people, he decided he would give the Planning Commission members the ultimate test. We're having a Planning Commission meeting in San Francisco. The meeting starts, and the ranch had a small vineyard that was part of the property that was there. So on this night, he said, we have some wine from the ranch. Everybody's invited to have some. And there were styrofoam cups, like half filled with wine. Drank the wine. And like five minutes later, Jones says, you've all just been poisoned. So immediately inside, my adrenaline starts running. People were yelling and screaming. Jones says, you have an hour to live. Jones says, no one leaves. And the minutes go by. People start saying, I can feel myself dying. I'm feeling faint. So after about 45 minutes, Jones says, okay, well, you haven't all been poisoned. This was a test to see how you handle death. So I thought, okay, he's teaching people what it's like to face your own mortality, your own death. That's how I rationalize that. I want to make it clear that was a rationalization on my part. Not one of them grabbed Jones by the throat, you know, you son of a bitch. There was none of that reaction. He had people that much cowed, that much under his control. He really enjoyed seeing what people did. And it was a test of loyalty, right? Are these people really willing to just lay down now that I told them I've killed them? He was very sadistic at that point. Looking back on it, I think the appropriate response would have been, this is a crazy MF and it's time for me to get out of Dodge. It's clear that as early as 1974, that Jim Jones realizes that some of the practices of People's Temple cannot be sustained. The punitive practices with people, the paranoid practices, all these things eventually mean that law enforcement is gonna come in and break up People's Temple. He needed a place that they could escape to in case criticism became too great and in case Jim Jones himself was in danger of being arrested. He loves Guyana because it's socialist. It's mostly minority because it's the only country in South America where the national language is English. He ultimately works out a deal with the Guyanese government and sends a crew out to start building Jonestown. So it started in 74. I think there were like seven guys that went down there. All of them had some heavy equipment experience. We cleared a lot of land and we built a lot of structures in very short time. It was hard, hard work. The clump of trees in the center of the clearing is a five-acre pig pasture. They are trying to build a village that would be able to hold about 500 people, to live there, to work there, to feed them from the crops and so forth. I would like to say at this time that all of this was made possible 
by our leader, Father Jones. This is the hottest part of the uh, entire year, and uh, they're doing real well. When I first heard about Jonestown, it was 1974. Tim Jones had just come back from Guyana and was giving a talk about Jonestown, and it's going to be an agricultural community. Back over here is the area that we're clearing for more planting. Potatoes and carrots and edos and uh, papaya. We could grow our own food and there would be a community and there wouldn't be any violence or racism. And it was going to be the promised land. Darren, how do you like it here in the promised land? Why it's better than Ukiah. My name is Anthony Simon. I'm here in the promised land. My name is Don Swanee, and um, I'm grateful to be down here. I'm working on a fishing trawler, and I enjoy going down the rivers, meeting new people. It's more freer down here, and it's more beautiful. <laughs> this is a walking stick, friends. But that's a gentle guy. Walking stick. <laughs> Jim Jones said to be able to go to Jonestown was a privilege. It was a reward to go there. The time that I spent there building the town that our community was going to come live in was one of the happiest times in my life up to that point. We are going to have peace in our promised land, Valley. Now, in retrospect, I know much of what he said at that time was just a flat-out lie. You were chosen to bring deliverance to this continent. You are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. I was a city hall reporter here in San Francisco. Notice Jones at a lot of events where he would bring in huge numbers of people for inconsequential meetings. So that piqued my curiosity. Why does he behave this way? Isn't it unusual for a religious figure to travel in this kind of exalted way? I thought there was more to Jim Jones. So I went to a local California magazine at the time called New West, and they said, um, okay, let's see what you got. I had heard Marshall Kilduff had been looking for me and Jeannie and Al Mills, who had defected before I did, called me one night and they said, oh, we're going to do an article. And I said that I would too, that I wasn't going to let them do it alone, that I would speak as well. The ex-members, the folks who had fled the church, said, here's what you don't know. And I think we were there till like 3 o'clock in the morning. I told him everything. The more power that he got, the sicker he got. The whippings got worse and worse. Our daughter was beaten 75 times with a board. I ran with my child out, got into my car, and he was yelling my name as I left. He told me that there would be an accident in which all three of us would be killed. Once you enter people's temple, you don't leave, or you don't leave very easily. There were death threats. There was a lot of pressure from the congregation. We talked it over with our children, explained to them that we were going to be quitting the church, and they said, well, Mom and Dad, we love you very much, and we just hope that when you do decide to quit the church, you move far away so we aren't the ones assigned to kill you. I don't think I really realized how dangerous a position that I was in but I discredit it to being young and not knowing any differently or any better. I think what we had to say need to be heard because in the past, Jim had always been able to stifle any bad press like that. So they were just blown away by what we had to say. We were beaten, we had to give up all our money. There's a sexual angle here that we don't think you know about. Fake healings. The church's inner dynamics. The whole thing. I had no idea. 
This was a new level of problem, a new level of a story. I talked to his aides, I talked to everybody I could at the church. So Jones knew I was working on stories, but he never wanted to talk. Jim advised us defectors were talking to New West Magazine, and there was going to be an article full of lies about People's Temple. We knew it was trouble. We knew that people were talking about what was happening behind closed doors, which we were not supposed to speak about. The lies were so incredible that anybody with the right mind would not believe them. The best thing to do with newspapers is to wipe your ass with them. Jones knew maybe his followers initially are going to believe in him. The father says none of it's true, it's fake news. But his political base, the mayor of San Francisco, the governor of California, he's going to lose that political clout. And when he loses that, he's going to lose his standing in San Francisco. He's going to look terrible. Jim was like hyper, and he increased the talk about enemies and defectors and traitors and people out to get us. When the story breaks, it's tremendously controversial. Everybody reads it, everybody's talking about it. Both San Francisco newspapers immediately assign their own reporters now. Dig in, do more, find more. Reverend Jim Jones works in some very unexpected ways. Why didn't you just get out? Where did all that money go? He had us sign papers, blank papers. No matter what goes on here, you go out and tell everybody everything's okay. Deny everything you hear about what's going on here. The TV stations are all there, flocking. Where's Jim Jones? The time the story came out and there was this doubt about him, he wasn't around to answer for it. In the New West article, some of the questions had to have direct answers. He didn't want to answer the questions. The shitstorm is not going to stop. So the only solution is to get out. I remember my father saying, we're going to Guyana. I think that Jim Jones was afraid to face the publicity and answer the questions uh, here in this country. After the New West article backlash had happened, groundswell started. What's the story behind Jim Jones? Was all the magic that people simple put out, was it true? And if you scratched the surface a little bit, you saw maybe it wasn't. In Guyana, Jim Jones was outraged by the New West article, and he was also very frightened. He was afraid that this would give the detractors of People's Temple the ability to break up the church. The original plan was that as soon as all this died down, he'd be back, but it's not dying down. What he's got to do is he's now got to make Jonestown the focal point of People's Temple. And now suddenly Jim Jones wants virtually everybody in People's Temple to get over there. I wasn't given a reason why I was going to Jonestown. Things were in such a frenzy. It was just, let's get people down there now. That summer, they began shipping people out. Buses went down to banks where people would deposit their money into church accounts. They lined them up with passports to get them out of the country legally. My wife, Gloria, was already in Guyana, and I wanted to be with her for the birth of my child. It wasn't going to happen. I was sent to New York City to help facilitate people getting to Guyana. The media attention on the temple at that time was intense. So they would fly out of different airports, whether it was Los Angeles, Sacramento, San Francisco, and they would fly on different airlines, and they would fly in groups of three. They always sat apart from each other. Nobody recognized anybody else. And there was a flight every day at 4.30. It's important to understand how isolated Jonestown was from Georgetown, 
the capital of Guyana. You've got 160 miles that cannot be driven. You have to either try to fly over the top of the jungle and land on a tiny airstrip, or you have to take a boat along the coast and down a river. It was a 19-hour boat trip from Georgetown up a river, way, 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 way up the river. I was seasick. It was not a pleasant trip, but part of me was happy. It's like, don't complain because you're on the way to the promised land. When we pulled up to the dock and we got off, I was still apprehensive. When we got on the tractor and we rounded this corner and I could just hear that, welcome, welcome all of you. Jonestown was a town, it was a community. From the doctor's office to the pharmacy. Medications here, one whole shelf that goes half the warehouse length. We have medical manuals, even how we could do surgery if we had to, if the civilizations we know it now began to crumble. To the classrooms, to the kitchen. Different containers around the place, we couldn't go through all the tremendous inventory. They built up Kool-Aid. That was built. From, from nothing, from nothing. It was really kind of remarkable that this whole little town was built in the middle of the jungle, far, far away from anything. I wanted to get back to my husband. I was happy to see my baby, my son, and spend time with him. When I finally got into Jonestown, I got to see Gloria and my son and Malcolm. I could actually feel tension leaving my body. Really, it was a physical sensation because it is incredibly beautiful and peaceful. But I thought it was exciting. We've been building this community. As I look out over it, it's the most fantastic thing. And we have made this part of the country. We've enriched it by everything that's growing in all these beautiful buildings and our medical clinic and our lovely homes. A typical day in Jonestown was up at five o'clock. There would be someone on the side of the, the cabin with the stick, five o'clock, five o'clock, so five o'clock. We worked six days a week and I was okay with that because I felt like I was building something. And now I was really a good socialist. Sweaty and this kind of stuff. I hated that. Oh, I hated that. I hated that. I hated walking out of your cabin on a, on in the rainy season and your feet are full of mud. And, you know, I hated all that kind of stuff. But you know something? When you're with 900 people you care about, it didn't seem that bad. I remember the dances, the youth dances. I remember some of the meetings that my father did. And we talked about building a new world, you know. Those are powerful to me. I felt like we were Che Guevara building a new world. That's how I felt. The people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. Things were good for a while. Grandma Bates, how do you like it here? I love it. I love it. It's, I love it better than any place I've been in my life. All of a sudden, things started shifting. I just love it. I hope we, everything is going to be all right for us.
Jonestown was ill-equipped to provide a life for all the people that arrived. And Jim Jones is aware that what's happening in Jonestown is not sustainable either. Ultimately, Jones has about a thousand people and a place built for half that. Almost instantly, there's not enough food. We're going to conserve on food, keep that up because we'll need every dollar because this is the only kind of place to be, freedom. As more people began coming, even the children weren't getting what they needed and the senior citizens definitely were not getting the food that they needed. We even sell bananas now because we're trying to make money. We need money so badly to take care of all of our family, to save them. Jones knows he's got money that could take care of that for decades, but he's not revealing that. So instead, people are told we've got to do better or we're going to starve and be humiliated. I know it's not pleasant, children. My God, somebody's got to fight this revolution. You're physically adjusting to the work, but you get used to it. You get used to the work. What you don't get used to is the sirens in the middle of the night. Or Jim's drugged, sometimes incoherent voice over a loudspeaker in the middle of the night. Attention, attention. There's still not enough energy shown by workers. Around the cottages, in my review, they're not clean. In Jonestown, there were loudspeakers everywhere. They went on 24-7 the voice of Jim Jones. This is essential, absolutely essential. Jim Jones did a terrible job of maintaining his leadership within the community of Jonestown. He would stumble, he would urinate off the side of the walkways. It was apparent that his drug use had increased, he was slurring his speech. We must stop the dilatoriness, dilatoriness, dilatory way in which some people regard their own property. Remember, his number one source of well-being, if you could even call that, was adulation or feeling like he was adored by the people around him. And now his source was finite. It was the same people every day, same thing. So what he tried to do was just escalate things. You people all tighten me up. God damn you, sons of bitches. God damn you. Because you sons of bitches, anything I do, you got to do. God damn you. Why don't you work like I do then? Why don't you take the burdens I do then? So I'm looking at all this. I'm seeing this. And I'm starting to really acknowledge what I'm seeing as not my imagination or not my ability to be a good socialist, but the fact that there is something seriously wrong here. I think Dad was very much aware of the fact that our town could not last. What we were doing was not sustainable. As Jim Jones realized what was happening at Jonestown was a kind of failed experiment, he and his leadership began to ask themselves, how can we still succeed in terms of history? And so this, we're an egalitarian community that's going to show the world how we can live as a utopian gathering of people, became instead, how do we show the world what a truly committed group of people would do if they are threatened with the disintegration of their community? The people that went to Jonestown wanted to believe in something. I'm no longer a man. I'm a revolution. I am the mighty wind of revolutionary change and they wanted to make a better world. I never saw us dying from within. I never ever saw it coming. 